How many of you have ever had somebody that you were going out to dinner with and then, you know, we're all going to dinner and then suddenly they get up and they don't have any money? How many of you have ever had that? Did you pay for them? Did you pay for them? Did you ever have that same group of people go out with you again and do that again to you? And you begin to wonder, what is going on? Did you ever begin to wonder about that? Well, I want you to think about that where your church is concerned. Now, I know a lot of you give. I know some of you don't give. But I want you to think about that when we take a look at this scripture. We looked at this last week, but I want you to think about it this way. It says, bring the tithe in the storehouse that there may be what? Food when you get there. Now, I appreciate when somebody takes me out to dinner. Robert and Brian have taken me out to dinner a bunch of times, and I'm always very thankful, very, very thankful for that. And other people have taken me out to dinner as well. And I'm always very thankful. But when I go out with regular friends, not that they're not regular friends, when I go out with my, my dinner, well, we've all got dinner buddies we go out to dinner with. They're, 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 well, Robert, not so much, but Brian, yes. Uh, we trade off. We trade off. If, if, if somebody doesn't have money that time, I don't mind paying for them because I know the next time we go out to dinner, they're going to pay for it. And we go off and back and forth, and it's not a big deal. Not a big deal. I don't even care if we go out to someplace expensive and I have to buy, and they go out to a breakfast place and they buy. It's no big deal. But it's the fact that we all share in that. It says, bring the whole time into the store so that we meet the food in my house and test me with test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open and throw open the windows, the floodgates of heaven, and pour out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. The reason why I mention that is two weeks from today, I know many of you may still remember what August is. August is the month that we are getting our rent nearly doubled. I will tell you this, for 18 years, we paid the same amount of rent. We were blessed for 18 years. I don't know if you, anybody ever lived in a place 18 years that the landlord did not go up on you. That's just like incredible. But starting two weeks from today, our rent will almost double. To give. It's a privilege to be able to give and to support an organization. And that's why we take a look at this scripture again where Jesus says, give and it will be what? Given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaved together, running together, running over, will be poured into your lap for the same measure you use. It will be what? So if you use a nickel to give, that's a good thing, but you're only expecting a nickel to come back or that same nickel to be used to give back to you. So I want us to thank the Lord, you know what? That he meets and supplies all of our needs, takes care of the band. And I will tell you something, I'm so proud of Alex. He was here before everybody else today. And he's the last one to leave. So give him a thank you for being here. I mean, he was here. Not that I'm not always the first one. He, I wasn't going to say that, but Alec wouldn't mind telling you that. No, I, just, I, I appreciate the fact that we're in a position to have good musicians that play, that can pick up anything and play at any moment, do anything. And that's the kind of people that we have. And we pay them better than scale. So the thing about it is, you do that. You do that, and that's the reason why I want you to come and be a part of the first part, the very beginning, because we get to have really good musicians play. I've been in churches 10 times our size, 20 times our size, that don't have the quality of musicians that we have here. And I tell you, I, I'm, I'm blessed every week by them. So let's, let's take a moment and let's pray before we receive this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have an opportunity to come together to worship you. Father, that you have met and supplied all of our needs. We all have jobs. We all get an opportunity to work. And Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that we're able, that we're well able. So Heavenly Father, it's a privilege that we come into your house today to worship you with our tithes and offerings. And Father, to, to be that person that you want us to be, a child of yours, not barely getting by, but Father, that you've taken care of all of our needs and you do it so well. So Heavenly Father, we worship you now this morning with our tithes and offerings and we do it now in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen and amen and amen. Well, I, I appreciate you with me on that. Now, I'm starting a new series today. Starting a new series and uh, I want to remind everyone 
that next Saturday is Doug's uh, funeral. I met with the people at, uh, well, matter of fact, I met with Brett and Kara. Uh, Brett is Kara's husband. Met him for the very first time on Friday. I went over all the, the this order of service and everything. It's going to be it's going to be a, a beautiful thing. And if you miss the last song, you will have really missed it. So I'm just telling you right up front. I told I told Missy about it this morning. I said I'm not going to tell you because I'll cry. And I'm, I'm crying now thinking about it. But it will be a fabulous day of celebration for him and. Uh, his mom and dad are actually going to be here. I wasn't expecting them to be here uh, because of their age, but they are going to, they will be there on, on Saturday, so it'll be a good time. Anyway, I'm starting a new series today, and it's God's mercy is for you. And we've talked about mercy and we've talked about grace. We're saying about grace today because I want us to take a look at mercy. Mercy. And I want to start by using a thought that I want to plant in your head, and this is the thought this morning. There is nothing greater than being used by God for something greater than yourself. You know, we all have jobs, and I don't know about you, but I, I have had opportunity to rethink a lot about my life last couple of weeks dealing with with Doug and, I, and it, it's a, it's a good it's a good thing it's a good thing to take a self inventory every once in a while and find out if you're really where you want to be and where you really want to be where God is concerned you know we grow up in this country and I I, <laughs> I was telling Missy something I heard this morning which I thought was just it was kind of like mind-boggling I was listening to NBR or CNN this morning brought their webcast this morning and they said you'll look back at this year as being one of the coolest years you can remember and that's a frightening thought frightening thought but it was also talking about uh, migrations around the world there are no I mean like animals migrate because of weather patterns they said we will begin to migrate about weather patterns. And I was thinking about growing up and how cool it was. I mean, and I lived in Wichita Falls, which is not known for being cool, but we would open the, the windows at night because it would be cool enough to sleep. And I'm going like, I'm thinking about my kids who live in Phoenix, who, I mean, their nights have not gotten less than 95 degrees. And both my kids have pools in their house and it's like bath water. I just can't imagine that. But we've grown up in this country, we've got an education better even than a lot of countries offer college that we've, our kids in grade school and high school grow up with better educations in some places. I mean, we get a job. We work, we work, we work. We get paid, we take home things, and we buy things. And then we retire at the end of that long season in our life you are so much more than all of that. Your life is much more than growing up, getting an education, getting a job, working, and then retiring. Your life is more than that. And I will ask you something to think about today. If you've never thought that your life was worth more than that or wondered why you were here and what you were supposed to do while you're here, that's a good question to ask yourself especially in light of these next few weeks in this message series that I'm going to be on. If you've never experienced an understanding about the reason why you're here is because of this, if you've never understood that, never experienced that, then I hope you will come to grips with that and ask yourself, where have I missed it? Where have I missed it? Because you need to know why you're here. I will tell you something. You are here for something bigger than just you. You're here for something much bigger than that. And I will tell you that I want you to find out, experience why I am here. So today, the, the message of today is, is really God can use anybody. And I want you to think about that. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Bob, you're a pastor and, you know, you're, you're who God uses. No, I'm this is just what I do. Every one of you do something. 
and every one of you do something that should and can impact other people's lives. And if not, you need to ask yourself, why not? Why not? I want us to take a look over here on Romans chapter 6. And I want to start here. It says, give yourself what? What's the next word? Completely to God. Every part of you. Because you've been brought from death to life. And now you want to be used by God for good and for His righteous purpose. Every one of us have been born again. Every one of us have been snatched from hell. Every one of us have. And I don't know about you, but I saw a story this week. It was an older guy. He was, he was on a boat, maybe one of, and I did. I ended up calling my, my former father-in-law, Doug, and I, because they have a, a similar catamaran, catamaran. There's a little bigger. But this guy was sailing from the west coast of South America, and he was going to go west, and the big lightning storm hit, took out all of his electronics, and he has been floundering around on the Pacific Ocean for two months, he and his dog. They've been drinking rainwater that they've caught and raw fish because they didn't have anything to cook with. When this sailing vessel found him, he was so thankful. He did not think he was going to survive. Every day, he thought, how long am I going to be out here in this space? But his life had been ransomed, picked up by these people. He was so thankful for them and thankful to get onto dry land. I saw this guy whose who, his countenance had changed because he was alive. Alive! That's the way you should feel. Every day, you should feel thankful that God has done something for you and that he could do something for you you were designed, shaped, formed by God for something for Him to use in this world. Every one of us, every one of us, we're here today because His mercy, we are still here doing something. You know, I know people secretly fear God can't use me because you don't know what I've done. I've got a past. Every one of us have a past. Some of us more colorful than others. And that's okay. But every one of us have a past. And these people say, well, I can't be used because of that. And other people say, you know, uh, I can't be used because I don't have the same gifts and talents and abilities as so-and-so. And so I can't be used because I'm not qualified. I can't be used because I've been disqualified. You know what? It doesn't matter. God can use every single one of us. I want us to, we're going to be taking a look at the life of Paul. Paul, single-handedly, is probably the most used person in all of the New Testament. Did more than anybody else. Wrote over half the New Testament. Started over 250 churches by himself. Was the most used man in the New Testament. The whole point is, is that we're going to take a look at how bad of a start he had to what a glorious finish he had. So he has given us some secrets of staying usable even when we don't think so. There's five of them. We're going to take a look at this one right here. The first we're going to take a look at is never forget it's all about what? God's mercy. You're still here because of God's mercy. How many accidents have you been in or nearly been in? How many? Think about that. I mean, we live in a city where they, I see people cutting off other people. I mean, right in front of me, I'll see people just swerve, and I'm going, I could have been three seconds further down the road. Just three seconds. Not a lot of time. And I think, I had to go back in and pick up something at the house. I could have been in that accident had I not. Had I not, had I not. No, it's not me. Had God not, had God not. You know, we've talked about the definitions of mercy and grace, but I want us to kind of take a look at mercy again just this morning. Mercy is the undeserved forgiveness. It's God's undeserved forgiveness. And it's also his unearned what? Kindness. 
unearned kindness. Undeserved forgiveness and unearned kindness. So with that, let's take a look at what Paul says over here in church at Corinth. This is Corinth in Greece. He says, God in his what? Say it with me. God in his what? Has given us this ministry and work to do. That's why we do not become discouraged and never give up. Because we've got work to do. And a lot of times people read that word mercy, uh, excuse me, ministry, and they begin to think that that's a very churchy term. It's really not. When you translate it really from the Greek, it really deals with service. So it's not a churchy term. It's something you do in the world. It's whatever you're doing, whatever you did, it's whatever you do, that is your act of service to this world. That's why God put you here. You know, I was talking to Matt about what he did. I never really knew until this morning what Matt did for a profession, and he's in HR. I never knew that. But he, is ser he has the opportunity to serve other people through his work of dealing with people. That's what he does. That's what he does. I think about, I think about Keith. He has a tremendous opportunity of service because he's serving lots of people every day. Whether you serve one or two or hundreds or thousands, you still have been put here by God for a service to other people. We do this work. We do this work. But Pastor Bob, you don't know what I've done all my life. I'll tell you something. I know what I've done. I know what I've done, and I will tell you, just because you're a pastor doesn't mean you've done things that you regret. There are a lot of things in my life I regret. If it were not for God's mercy, I couldn't do the things I do. But I will tell you, I don't care what you've done in your past. God's mercy is still reaching out, still doing for you what he's done for me and what he's done for other people. I think about Paul. <laughs> what we don't oftentimes remember, I remember it because it helps me through my daily struggles of who I am. You know, Paul was one of those people, he was a horrible man. I mean, horrible. We would rank him right up there with anti you know, anti-Christian terrorist. He would be a member of some, some group of people in Islamic people, terrible. I mean, horrible. I mean, he went from village to village killing Christians and think he was doing a good job. I mean, he would be that person that would run in and break your front door down and kill you just because you were a Christian. And he enjoyed it because he thought he was ridding the world of this group of people. That's how bad he was. Horrible man. You a murderer from, from the get-go. So what I want to remind you is, your past is your past. You can't change it. But the good news is, it doesn't preclude you from serving God. Whatever it is you've done doesn't make any difference. And you know what? Who cares? Everyone. And I don't care where they are in church today, what platform, what podiums they're speaking from or in, they are all, we are all on the equal plane. Don't let anyone ever tell you or get you to think, insult you to the place where you're less than they are because we are all exactly the same. If but God's mercy, we would be here. Your past is your past. Paul says over here at Galatians, he just kind of reminds us. He says, you know what I was like. How I violently, violently persecuted Christians. I did my best to get rid of them. But then something happened. Thank God something has happened. For it pleased God in his kindness to choose me and call me even before I was born. And Paul says, what undeserved mercy. God knew you before the foundations of the world. He knew you. Kingsley, he knew you. God knew you. Before we were born, before we were formed, he knew us and he wove into us his plan, his purpose for our lives. You know, I used to think when I was younger, 
I will never find out what that is. I'll never live long enough. You know what? I've lived long enough. I've lived long enough. And I thank God every day for that purpose. But Paul calls it that undeserved mercy. Undeserved mercy. And he says over here in, in Ephesians, he makes this statement. Oh, let me pull this over. He says over here, and in, in, well, I'll read it to you, and it's Ephesians. Did I have it up there and I miss it? Let's see, back up. Nope. I will, I will tell it to you. It is God himself who made us that we are and given us this new life from Jesus Christ. Long ago, he planned it so that we would spend our lives helping others. That's what Ephesians says. But I want to show you some people. If you've ever thought that you were excluded because you did something that was, or you're something different, that God would exclude you. I did a little research on a bunch of people. Let's start with this one, Abraham. Abraham was old at 90. He was called. But he didn't even start, his calling didn't even start to kick in until he was 100. So you can't be ever too old to be used by God. I mean, there's not a person in this room that's excluded because of age. Jacob. Jacob was a chronic liar. <laughs> ran away from every difficult situation he was ever faced with. Just ran away. He was a liar. So there's hope for some political people I know. Leah. Leah was just plain unattractive. She was hit with an ugly stick, I would say. The only thing the Bible says about her was that she had brown eyes. That's all. <laughs> bless her heart. Yeah, yeah, you'd think that. You know, bless her heart, you know. Joseph was mentally and physically abused. He was abused. I mean, we he would have a right to sue his family members for the physical and mental abuse and torture they put him through. I mean, these are like reading the stories of today. Go on. Gideon was the poorest in his family. You can't be too poor not to be used by God. I mean, Gideon was a, quite a guy. I mean, the story that he has is even greater than some. Jonah was fearful, reluctant, and we could say he was given a drink. Yeah, he was a drunken sailor is what the Bible says. So when we start to think about the things that would exclude us from, from serving in God's kingdom, these would be some of them. Elijah, he was suicidal, moody. Yeah. Naomi, an elderly widow. Can't be too old. Can't be widowed to get out of it. No, because God still uses those people. Jeremiah, he was chronically depressed. The Bible calls him the weeping prophet. Chronically depressed. You know, where was Procupion back then? <laughs> he could have used some. Look here. David had an affair had his mistress' husband killed. Now, if you think that somebody needed to be excluded, this would have been one of them. I mean, but he wrote the book of Psalms. And God called him the apple of his eye. John the Baptist, he was eccentric and odd. I know people like that. Yeah. Peter, he was impulsive, had a serious anger management problems. Uh, you know, if you remember there in the Garden of Enemy, uh, the Garden of Eden, he took a sword and just lopped off that guy's ear. I mean, he couldn't control himself at all. And Martha, she worried a lot. If you're a worrier, you can't get out of serving God either. All these are people. Samaritan woman, she had seven failed marriages. Go on, okay. Zacchaeus, an unethical scam artist from the get-go. Thomas had doubts about, I mean, from the very beginning. Timothy was timid. He was a disciple, timid and fearful. And Moses, David, and Paul were all guilty of murder. All guilty of murder. So my question is, what's your excuse? Have you got anything different than these folks? To keep you from doing what God has purposed for you in your life? Who has given you an opportunity to do what you're supposed to be doing? No. Because the whole point is, is that God has got something really good for you. Here's that if Ephesians verse. It is God himself who has made us what we are. And given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives helping other people. 
I feel sorry for those people that don't have a clue about what they're supposed to be doing while they're here on this earth. And they sit around wondering, what am I supposed to be doing? You're supposed to be serving other people. You're supposed to, by your life, you're supposed to be showing the life of Christ to other people. The second thing I want to share with you is about the fact that the way to be is simply to be real. I know too many churchy people. They're too churchy. They are. And nobody can reach the heights of that person. You can't be Paul-like and be too churchy. You can't be. God wants us to be real with other, other people all the time. Why do you think that Jesus hung around with the sinners? He went to all the bars. He went to all the hooker places. He went into set with all of the people that you shouldn't sit with and was condemned for it by the churchy people. God doesn't want you to be churchy. He wants you to be you. Look over here in 2 Corinthians. Paul says this. He says, we don't try to trick anyone. And we don't twist the word of God. Instead, we teach the truth. What's the next word? Plainly. Showing everyone who we are. Paul reminded everybody his past so he would be relatable. Everybody's got a past. Some people are just more embarrassed by it than others. But I'll tell you something. If you're dead to self, you can never be embarrassed by what's happened and what God has saved you from. Then they can know in their hearts what kind of people we are in God's sight. You know what? When you're not afraid to tell people who you are, what you've done, and where God has brought you from, God can use you. God can use you. Look over in Romans. Paul says this over here. He says, The spirit we receive does not make us slaves again to fear of where we've been, what we've come from. It doesn't give us fear of that. No, it makes us children of God. It's the mercy of God that keeps us in perspective I'm just a sinner that's been saved by grace and the mercy of God. I just have. So here is a key right here. Remember, it's never about me. My service to others has nothing to do with me. But it has an awful lot to do about God. And His mercy keeps me here every day doing for Him and others what He's asked me to do. It's His mercy. You know, we can do anything we want to for God because it's not about us. It's about Him. Look over in 2 Corinthians. Paul makes this statement here. He says, Our message is not about ourselves. It is about Jesus Christ as the Lord. We are merely your servants to Jesus' name. Paul was telling the church, that all we are is servants. That's all we are. We are to serve Him. We are to serve God in everything that we do, touching the lives of people. He goes on to say this in verse 7. He says, We are like clay jars in which this treasure is stored. The mercy of God. I want you to think about all the good things that God has given you. All the wonderful gifts, the talents. And He stored them in our ourselves as clay pot clay pots now some I can recognize some have got bigger pots than others but we're bigger but inside we have this storage these great and mighty things on the inside of us you know what happens with a clay pot when you drop it it cracks or breaks open doesn't it and all of us are just a bunch of cracked pots hopefully that allow the light of God to shine out from us Everywhere we go. You know, that's why I said, don't hide this treasure under a basket. Don't hide the light of God, what God's done for you and His mercy. Don't hide that. Don't be guilty of hiding that. But instead, open that up and let other people say, the real power comes from God and not from us. I can do nothing. Jesus said, I can do nothing away from what the Father has told me to do or has told me to say. That's all we've got to do. We should never be embarrassed by that. We're just all pots. <laughs> I like that. I thought about it this week and I said, you know, we're just a bunch of cracked pots. That's all. That's all. The fourth thing Paul talks about, just in these few little things about, about his glory, about the God's glory, is just he uses my pain to help others. 
you might think about that. You know, we don't we don't live in a, a life of much pain today because I mean we've got doctors to take care of pains, drugs to take care of pains, acupuncture to take care of pains. You know, cold, heat, compresses. I mean, we've got all kinds of things to deal with pain. But when everything is going right for somebody, they don't always listen. But I'll tell you who will listen. The people whose lives are in pain, who are hurting, they'll listen. They're not going to listen to you saying you don't have a pain or a trouble in the world. They'll listen to you because you've had some pains, troubles. They'll, they'll, they'll listen. Why? Because they can relate. Paul was all about relating to the people of the time. He was never, he never pulled away from all the things, the trials and challenges that he went through. He kept sharing them and sharing them. You know, he talked about how many times he was beaten, how many times he was shipwrecked, how many times, you know, this happened to him, how many times he was left out of the sea, how many times he would this, and how many times that. Because people could relate to that because of the times that they lived in. They all lived in pain. They didn't have what we have today. And it's hard to tell people today who have everything going for them about Jesus because what do I need Jesus for? I got everything I need. But when you see them going through a pain, trial, situation, I'll tell you one that's very real. Missy and I will know because we've heard, we heard Doug I did, being a father, of 12 years that he and his former wife were divorced. 11 years of that and probably six months. He lived estranged from his own son. That's strange. They saw each other occasionally. Doug would go down to Waco to try to go see a Baylor football game, and Brian would live would be in, in the stands across the way, wouldn't even come across the stands to see his dad. February, when Doug went into the ICU, and I went to see him that day when he got admitted. And when I was there, I was just sitting there talking with him, and all of a sudden, Brian walked in the door. His life changed because he saw the pain for the very first time that his dad was going through and realized how short that life might, have, might be and how much time he had wasted. Wasted. I didn't have to tell him anything. He already knew it. And from that weekend... Back in February, Brian has been up here almost every weekend. And I wanted to tell him, yeah, but you missed, you missed. There's nothing you can do about that. But people will recognize when you can relate to the pain that they've been in, suddenly their life is open, different. So Paul was always using his pain. Look over here. Paul makes this statement in Corinthians. He says, we often suffer. We often suffer but we're not crushed. Even when we don't know what to do, we never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us, and when we're knocked down, we get up again. You know, people want to hear the pain that you've been through because whether they'll admit it or not, they've had their share. They've had their share, and it, it suddenly they hear you talking about how God got you out of yours and got you past and you got back up on your feet because of the mercy of God. You know what? You will, you will speak into people's lives and they, they will be thankful and it will change who they are. Look over here. He goes on to say, all of these sufferings of ours are for your benefit. The problems that I've been in have opened doors for you. And the more of you who are one to Christ, the more there are to thank him for his great, what? Mercy, and the more God gets glory. God will use every pain in your life, every struggle that you've had, keep everything that you've gone through, God will use that. The problem is, we're, we're embarrassed about the things that we've gone through. We're embarrassed about it. We don't want to show that pain. We don't want to show the struggle. We don't want to show the, 
the difficulties that we went through or this, you know, sometimes just the plain stupid things that we did. We don't want, uh, we were embarrassed by those things. I have done too many funerals in my life. And I will tell you, when I've seen a casket open and the, that corpse was there, they're never embarrassed about being there. They're not embarrassed by, by, the, by the way they look. I'll tell you a cute story about my mom. My, <laughs> my mom, she knew she was dying. And she said, I don't want a funeral. I don't want anybody looking in there and say, oh, doesn't she look good today? <laughs> she said, nobody looks good in that box. Nobody looks good. But I've never heard them say anything about it because they are truly dead to self. And when we are truly dead to self about the things that we've gone through, the problems that we've endured, the struggles that we've had, the challenges that we've, that we've endured, God will always get the glory out of that. Because you're changing someone's life by cracking open that, we don't want, we don't want, we don't want anybody to see that pain that we went through. Yeah, but you know what? When you do, other people see the struggles that you've had and they, their lives will be changed. Look over here. He goes on to say, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day for our present troubles, I love this, are quite small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us an immeasurably great glory that will last forever, 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 and ever, ever. So he concludes with this last thought right here. Just stay focused on eternity. When you start to think about how long eternity is, if you just thought about one millennial, one million years, being a single grain of sand in the ocean, maybe that'll give you a better concept. This life is a flash. It's like magicians flash paper, hold something up, and it just burns up and it's a vapor. That's how long your life is if you get to live to be 100. So Paul goes over here in 2 Corinthians, he says, these little troubles are getting us ready for eternal glory that will make our troubles seem like nothing. Nothing. There is a place over in Wichita Falls it's called Jean's Hamburgers. It's a hole in the wall. It's really just a little, little old house that they converted to a little dining room. To a little dining room. And uh, my sister and I and a friend were sitting there having dinner. And suddenly you could hear this rumble of all of these bikes, Harleys, bigger bikes, surrounding this little house and all parking on the parking lot. And I mean, some of these guys, my underestimate would be 300 pounds. Big guys, I mean, big. They're the people you want your picture taken next to, so it so shows how small you are. Even if you're big, you look small, because they're huge. And my mom is facing them, I'm not facing them, because we're sitting at a booth, and my mom says, I'm going to go over and ask that guy how much he weighs. I bet he weighs every bit of 350. My mom was saying that. I said, I said, you're not going to get up and do that. You're absolutely not. You are not going to do that. And she said, okay, I won't. So in a little bit, she says, I need some more tea. It was her excuse to get up. And I didn't, I didn't even pass my mind. She got up and she went over. And the biggest guy over there she could find. Now, they were, you can imagine. My mom was about 5'2", and weighed, I think, when she passed, maybe 145, 150 pounds, maybe at the most. She went over there and says, you know what? My son and I are over here thinking that you, <laughs> you weigh every bit of 350. And this guy, big, burly guy, big old beard, big, big, fingers as big as sausages, you know, big guy. She says, yes, ma'am, you're right. I weigh 350 pounds. She comes over and says, see, I told you. 
I said, you could have gotten us all killed. She wasn't embarrassed about doing that at all. I wanted to crawl under the table at that moment. She, wasn't, she said, you know what? I'm going to die sometime. <laughs> Our trouble seemed like nothing. Well, that trouble looked like it could have killed us that day. Fortunately for us, they were all good natured guys. We got out of there as fast as we could. But he goes on to make this statement here. Closes up this. So we don't look at the trouble we can see right now. You know, the moment that we're looking right now, this is just temporal moment. Rather, we look forward to what we have not yet seen. We're looking towards that. For the troubles we see will soon be over, but the joys to come will last forever. Forever. His mercy endures forever. He has woven us our DNA. He is, I love what Jeremiah says. He has woven me together in my mother's womb. He took us from his thoughts and created us for his glory, for his purpose. So my final thought to you today is, do you want your life to be used by God? Do you want your life to be used by Him? Or will you always wonder, what was I supposed to be doing? What was I supposed to do all those years? What was I supposed to accomplish for God? We all have a reason for being here. And I can tell you the moment when that reason is up, we will not be here. We will be rewarded for the purpose that we have fulfilled in God's eyes. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your mercies endure forever. And every day they are renewed to us. Father, we blow through these, we'll get another batch tomorrow. And we blow through those, you are so merciful, you give them all over again. We never run out. So, Father, for the mistakes that we've made that we try to use as excuses not to be used by you, we don't have any. By the things that we don't know that we wish we did or our abilities and talents and gifts were, were different so that we could be like that person or this person, you have planned us, each and every one, to be a glorious original, to be used by you, to touch the lives of other people so that they can understand how much you love them as well. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it this morning. And Father, we thank you that we enjoy your mercy every single day. And Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Next week, this is the title for my next Sunday's message. What causes our personal failures? What causes us to miss the mark? That'll be next Sunday. God bless you. We'll see you next week.